Good morning, Grace Bible Church. We're glad you've set aside time today to worship the Lord at home. The Heidelberg Catechism asks how knowing that all things happen according to God's wise and providential will helps us. And the first answer or the first part of the answer that's given is that we can be patient in adversity. Now, I don't really like learning patience. It takes too long. But we can be patient because we know God is sovereign. We know that he is wise and good and he can be trusted. Um, we can trust him even in a pandemic. And we've been praying for you all. We've been praying that we as a church, we as individual believers would indeed uh, be strengthened by God so that we might be patient in these trying times. And let me encourage you, entrust yourself to God. He is always faithful. He will never fail you. This morning, let's turn our attention to God's word. We're going to read Psalm 136. I'll give you a moment to turn there in your Bibles. We're going to read the entire Psalm. And there is a theme here in Psalm 136 that the psalmist wants us to dwell on. And I want you to see if you can figure out what it is as we read through this passage of scripture. So Psalm 136, beginning in verse one. Give thanks to the Lord, for he is good, for his steadfast love endures forever. Give thanks to the God of gods, for his steadfast love endures forever. Give thanks to the Lord of lords, for his steadfast love endures forever. To him who alone does great wonders, for his steadfast love endures forever. To him who by understanding made the heavens, for his steadfast love endures forever. To him who spread out the earth above the waters, for his steadfast love endures forever. To him who made the great lights, for his steadfast love endures forever. The sun to rule over the day, for his steadfast love endures forever. The moon and stars to rule over the night, for his steadfast love endures forever. To him who struck down the firstborn of Egypt, for his steadfast love endures forever and brought Israel out from among them, for his steadfast love endures forever. With a strong hand and an outstretched arm, for his steadfast love endures forever. To him who divided the Red Sea in two, for his steadfast love endures forever, and made Israel pass through the midst of it, for his steadfast love endures forever, but overthrew Pharaoh and his host in the Red Sea, for his steadfast love endures forever. To him who led his people through the wilderness, for his steadfast love endures forever. To him who struck down great kings, for his steadfast love endures forever, and killed mighty kings, for his steadfast love endures forever. Sihon, king of the Amorites, for his steadfast love endures forever. And Og, king of Bashan, for his steadfast love endures forever, and gave their land as a heritage, for his steadfast love endures forever, a heritage to Israel his servant, for his steadfast love endures forever. It is he who remembered us in our low estate, for his steadfast love endures forever, and rescued us from our foes, for his steadfast love endures forever. He who gives food to all flesh, for his steadfast love endures forever. Give thanks to the God of heaven, for his steadfast love endures forever. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Let's join our hearts together now in prayer. Great are you, Lord, and greatly to be praised. Your greatness is unsearchable. Who is a God like you, majestic in holiness, awesome in glory, working wonders? Who on earth can compare to you, O Lord? Who among the creatures in heaven is equal to you? 
O Lord God Almighty, who is a mighty God like you? For you are great and you do wondrous things. You alone are God. You are the King eternal, immortal, invisible. Father, we adore you as the sovereign Lord. You are the almighty God, the maker of heaven and earth. Lord Jesus Christ, we adore you as the eternal Son of God, begotten from the Father before all ages, God of God, light of light, true God from true God. For us and for our salvation, you came down from heaven and became incarnate by the Holy Spirit, eternal God in our very flesh. We praise you as our exalted Redeemer, our mediator at God's right hand, your very presence in heaven is your intercession for us. Holy Spirit, we adore you, the comforter sent from the Father and the Son. You have been given to us in order to bring us into the full enjoyment of our salvation. And so our great and awesome triune God, we worship and glorify you this morning. Gracious God and Father of mercy, we confess that we have sinned against you. Who among us would want to list all of their faults? We all offend in many different ways and our sins are more numerous than the hairs of our head. We have every reason to be humbled for the pride of our hearts, which has deceived us. We've thought of ourselves more highly than we ought to think. We've not made an honest, sober assessment of ourselves. We've not walked humbly with you, our gracious God. We confess that we've sinned against our brothers and sisters in Christ. We've not studied carefully the things that make for peace. We have failed to do all within our power to build up and encourage others. We've been all too ready to judge and have forgotten that we will soon stand before this judgment seat of Christ. Where we've wronged each other, Lord, lead us into the path of humility, confessing our wrongdoing to each other, seeking forgiveness and peace as much as it depends on us. Merciful Father, we ask that you would forgive our pride and selfishness for your namesake. Pardon our iniquity for it is great. Turn to us and be gracious to us, wash us thoroughly and cleanse us from our sin. Oh, Father, even as we confess our sins to you, we remember that you are good and you are always ready to forgive. In fact, more ready to forgive than we are to confess. And so we take heart knowing that we have an advocate in heaven, Jesus Christ, the righteous one. He is the propitiation for our sins. We put our trust in your promise that if we confess our sins, you are faithful and just to forgive us our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. How blessed we are, O oh God, that our sins are forgiven, that our sins are covered because of the shed blood and the perfect righteousness of Christ. And so our steadfast and heavenly Father, we thank you for the riches of your mercy and grace. We revel in the peace that we have with you since we have been justified in your sight through faith in Jesus Christ. We thank you for your continued presence with us during these trying days. We're grateful that you are not a God who is far off, but a God who is near in the person of your son and through the indwelling presence of the Holy Spirit. Oh God, we, we thank you that by and large, this church has been spared from the virus. We ask that you would continue to protect us, that you would continue to keep us healthy and strong. Father, we pray for healthcare workers and others on the front lines of serving the sick and the suffering. Give them energy, sustain them as they work long hours and sometimes don't have the supplies that they need. Keep them going, Father. Give wisdom to our elected officials and other national, state and local leaders O oh Lord, may they use their position and authority to serve the common good. And our God, we ask you this morning that we would soon be able to meet again as a church. We long to gather in your presence as the people of God, 
to lift up one voice in praise and prayer, to sit under the preaching of your word, to sit around the Lord's table. We pray, God, that you would make that happen. But we also ask that you would grant us patience, enable us to be both faithful Christians and obedient citizens. Your word instructs us to live wisely in this world, and so we ask that you would grant us your wisdom. Help us to live in a godly manner that we might adorn the gospel of Jesus Christ and give no reason to the world to accuse us of being troublemakers. Oh God, help us not to be enamored with foolish controversies, not to be distracted by unhelpful conspiracy theories. May we give ourselves to prayer. May we strengthen ourselves in your word. May we seek to love and to serve and to bless our families, our church, and our neighbors. May the gospel continue to sound forth from Grace Bible Church in creative ways. We ask that people would happen upon our YouTube channel, that they would stumble upon our, our sermon audio page, and that they would hear your word, that they would turn from their sin and put their faith and trust in Jesus Christ. And so, our God and Father, we ask that you would fulfill now our desires and our petitions as may be best for us and in a way that brings you much glory. We offer these prayers in the strong name of Jesus Christ, our Savior. Amen. Well, I invite you to turn in your Bibles to Exodus chapter 15. We'll be looking at Exodus 15, verses 1 through 21 today. Exodus chapter 15. One of the things that's been really interesting to me as of late has been noticing how many pandemic playlists have been curated uh, in the last several weeks. You can Google something about pandemic playlist or coronavirus playlists, and you'll find all kinds of compilations of groups of songs that have been gathered together that people can listen to as they seek to put words and music to what they're feeling. It's interesting that some turn to darker songs, maybe it's the end of the world as we know it, or Armageddon. Others to more upbeat songs or happy songs, Here Comes the Sun some even singing Amazing Grace in all kinds of settings. But songs give expression to the many things that we may be feeling. And Ryan had posted a music edition of helpful resources on our website, and it's got a great group of resources there of songs to listen to, but the post begins with a quote from Luther that says, beautiful music is the art of the prophets that can calm the agitations of the soul. It is one of the most magnificent and delightful presents God has given us. Well, in looking at these various playlists, I didn't find Exodus 15 or the Song of the Sea uh, on any of them. And even though we don't know what this song sounded like as the people sang it, it is definitely one of the gifts that God has given us. Because this song that the people sang after the Red Sea shows us some of the things that we can be singing about as God's people, anthems that should be in our hearts and on our lips, whether we're in the midst of a crisis or sheltering at home or throughout the entirety of the Christian life. And so before we look at the content of the song, which is what we'll spend most of our time focusing on this morning, I want us to briefly consider uh, what it tells us about singing, how this account unfolds and, and what it tells us about God's people and song. The first thing that we notice is that this account in Exodus 15 begins and ends with descriptions of the people singing this song. If you notice in verse one, it says, then Moses and the people of Israel sang this song to the Lord saying, and then the song unfolds. And then if you jump down past the song, past what's been indented in your uh, text most likely, we come to verse 20, then Miriam and the prophetess, the sister of Aaron, took a tambourine in, in her hand and all the women went out after her with tambourines and dancing and Miriam sang to them. And so this song is sandwiched in between accounts of it, of it being sung. And one of the things that that does is it resumes the narrative after the song. But secondly, I think the repetition of the fact that this was sung reminds us that this is something that's to happen over and over again with the people of God. 
That's a pattern that's been unfolding in the Exodus account. Instructions are given, but then instructions are repeated to show that these things are to be commemorated and a part of the regular life of the people, just like the Passover, the Feast of Unleavened Bread. And so what we see right away is that singing in response to God's deliverance is to be part of the regular life of God's people. But the second thing that we see about singing before um, we even move into the content is that this was something that was for all of Israel. It's something that was for all of Israel. It says Moses and the people of Israel in verse one sang this song. And this could have been sung antiphonally where they're singing back and forth uh, one leading and then maybe the congregation responding, but all of the people were involved. One of the things that this text shows us though is that women also played a key role in this singing. Miriam is highlighted here as a prophetess. Uh, we come to understand that she's Moses' sister and she's involved in communicating God's word to the people. She teaches all the women of Israel this song. And one commentator pointed out that in this way, through her teaching the women, this song came to be known in every household in Israel. As we think about these mothers and daughters who would learn this song and sing it in their homes. And one of the things that we don't see very clearly in our English translations is in verse 20 when it says that she sang the song, or in verse 21, Miriam sang to them. That word them there is a masculine pronoun showing that it's not just to the ladies that Miriam sang this song, but that she sang it to the men and women of Israel. And so just as women had been mightily involved in God's redemptive work throughout um, biblical history, and most recently, women playing a key role in even saving Moses so he could be raised up as the deliverer, now they are playing a key role in celebrating that redemption and in teaching his ways. And so what we see right at the beginning is that all of Israel, men and women, participated in singing. Singing about God's deliverance is something that is for all the people of God. And then finally, I just want us to note that singing is also a whole-bodied response to God's deliverance. Singing is depicted here as a whole-bodied response to God's deliverance. In verse 20, it says Miriam took a tambourine, or it's perhaps a small drum in her hand, and all the women went out after her with tambourines and dancing. This is the first place in scripture that dancing before the Lord is mentioned in the Bible, and Miriam and the women are doing this, and what we see is whole-bodied expressiveness was a part of their singing praise to God. And it's a reminder for us that all throughout scripture, Expressiveness in various ways is spoken of as a part of our worshipful song, whether that's dancing or raised hands or crying out in joy over God's deliverance. Now, certainly when we gather together, we should consider questions of distraction and love of neighbor as we think about our expressiveness. But we also need to remember that scripture's impulse is towards whole-bodied expressions of praise. Maybe you've been taught, either explicitly or implicitly, that emotion is lesser or wrong, and stoicism and intellect are more superior when it comes to the worship of God. But our emotions and our ability to emote are part of how God created us, and those things are needed and most celebrated when it comes to singing and declaring praise for what God has done. And so what does just thinking about singing mean for us now while we're unable to gather together in corporate praise? Well, singing has a corporate aspect of it to it. We see this right away. The people are all doing this together in various ways. And I miss that corporate singing, don't you? I've really come to realize in a, a new and unique way for me personally, how there is nothing like gathering together and singing as the people of God. You can listen to a soundtrack that has a group of people singing along and in response, but it's not the same as being together with your local body. And so we miss that and we long for that. But singing as a believer has always included more than just corporate singing. It's been something that 
individuals can do, whether by themselves or in their families, as, as many of us are now learning and being stretched to do in a new way during this time. And so this passage is right from the start, it's about singing. What it does is it, it encourages us to see this time, even in the midst of this pandemic, as a time to continue to foster and grow in our whole bodied responses to God's victory in song. And we can be doing that privately and looking forward to the time when we can gather together to do it corporately as well. And so singing is something that's important for the people of God. But now let's turn to consider what this song teaches us about the content of our songs. And, and as we turn to look at this song in particular, let's ask for the Lord's help as we consider the wonders of these themes together. Our Heavenly Father, we ask that you would help us now as we turn to your word, that you would teach us what it means to make music and melody in our hearts that are filled with praise to you. Will you help us to grow in our ability to sing both privately and one day again corporately as your people as we consider your word. Spirit, help us, um, give us hearts of faith, and we pray that you would help us to see the truths that you want us to see. We ask this all in Jesus' name, amen. And so as we look at this song and what it teaches us about the melodies we're to be singing to the Lord, the first thing that we notice is that we're to sing about the Lord's power. We're to sing about the Lord's power. And we notice this in particular in verses one through 12. So here verses one through 12 as I read them. Then Moses and the people of Israel sang this song to the Lord saying, I will sing to the Lord for he has triumphed gloriously. The horse and his rider he has thrown into the sea. The Lord is my strength and my song and he has become my salvation. This is my God and I will praise him. My father's God and I will exalt him. The Lord is a man of war. The Lord is his name. Pharaoh's chariots and his host he cast into the sea, and his chosen officers were sunk in the Red Sea. The floods covered them. They went down into the depths like a stone. Your right hand, O Lord, glorious in power. Your right hand, O Lord, shatters the enemy. In the greatness of your majesty, you overthrew your adversaries. You send out your fury. It consumes them like stubble. At the blast of your nostrils, the waters piled up. The floods stood up in a heap. The deeps congealed in the heart of the sea. The enemy said, I will pursue, I will overtake, I will divide the spoil. My desire shall have its fill of them. I will draw my sword and my hand shall destroy them. You blew with your wind, the sea covered them. They sank like lead in the mighty waters. Who is like you, O Lord, among the gods? Who is like you, majestic in holiness, awesome in glorious deeds and doing wonders? You stretched out your right hand, the earth swallowed them. One of the key themes that this song introduces as we consider the Lord's power is that the Lord is a warrior. Look with me at verse three, and this is the first time that this is mentioned in scripture. The Lord, or Yahweh, is a man of war, or a warrior. The Lord is his name. Part of what's that, that saying with the Lord being his name and associating that with him being a man of war is that part of Yahweh's identity is that he is a warrior God. Now, is that something that you think about very often? I think for many of us, it's something that's kind of foreign to us. We, we may know that idea, we come across it in the Psalms and, and later in scripture, but it definitely pushes against many cultural sentimentalities of the day. We live in a time where war and aggression are often blanket condemned, um, even though they're not always wrong or not always done in unrighteous ways. But what I want us to see is the beauty of this phrase, that the Lord is a warrior. So we can come to truly praise our God as a warrior. And this song gives us the tools to help us do just that. And one of the ways that it does that is it shows us the enemy's perspective in verse nine. 
You see, part of the reason that we may shy away from God as warrior is that we often don't have enemies fresh in our minds. We are often living in situations very disconnected from hand-to-hand -hand combat. But as you think of the context of the Israelites, they just had the mightiest army in the world. They had chariots coming at them full speed to destroy and enslave them. And the people who were coming to destroy and enslave them were the very same people who had killed their baby boys all those years before and who had been flogging their mothers and fathers and sisters and brothers. And so verse 9 gives us some behind-the-scenes insight into Pharaoh's thinking in particular. And these short staccato lines show this rapid, urgent nature of his pursuit as he goes after God's people. Verse 9 says, I will pursue, I will overtake, I will divide the spoil. Notice there that the Israelites, as in accord with God's plan, plundered the Egyptians on their way out, and now Pharaoh is coming after them to plunder them. And we see that re-enslavement was not all that Pharaoh desired. He says, my desire shall have its fill of them. Notice that his desire is to consume people. He says, I will draw my sword, my hand shall destroy them. And so he desired revenge and destruction, and any resistance to him would be destroyed by the sword. And what verse 9 really reminds us of is what's at the heart of the conflict when we see the Lord showing up as warrior. It's a battle against the hand of the enemy. Remember Pharaoh's words, who is the Lord that I should obey him, back in chapter 5. And here what we see depicted is a hand that's lifted against Yahweh, a hand that is bent on destroying his people. My hand shall destroy them. But then, most of the song actually is in contrast to Pharaoh's hand. And we see the divine warrior's power. We see the divine warrior's hand. And throughout this song, there are some terms that we need to be aware of. One is hand, and then right hand, and arm. And these are all ways of speaking of Yahweh's power. And in verses 1 through 18, those words occur six times. And then if we have Miriam's refrain um, in the end of the section in verse 21, then what happens is these hand-arm terminologies occur seven times. And I'm sure that that's not an accident, as this song is focusing on the complete power of Yahweh's hand in contrast to his enemies. Much of this is seen in his power over the sea. And we talked about that some last week, but notice with me verse 8. At the blast of your nostrils, waters piled up. And then verse 9, you blew with your wind and, and the sea covered them. Or verse 10, rather. You see, the glorious power of the Lord's hand is seen in his control of nature, both in his control of the sea and the wind. But throughout this song, what it focuses on almost even more is his power that's praised particularly for what he did to his enemies, even though that's through the sea. Notice with me verse 6. Your right hand, O Lord, glorious in power. Your right hand, O Lord, shatters the enemy. And throughout this song, that shattering is depicted over and over again. The horse and the rider he has thrown into the sea. Pharaoh's chariots and his horse he cast into the sea. His chosen officers, that means the best of the best, the, the Navy SEALs, as it were, were sunk in the Red Sea. They went down to the depths like a stone. They sank like lead. He consumed them like stubble in verse 7. As we come to verse 12, you stretched out your right hand and the earth swallowed them. The picture that's happening here is the heart of the earth, which elsewhere could be referred to as Sheol or the grave, really overtook them as the Lord warred against them. You see, what this song shows us is the Lord's right hand is mighty because he shatters his enemies. He brings them to nothing and he hands them over to death. 
Now, as you're hearing that, you may start to think, okay, I can see how that's a good thing if Egyptians are coming after you to kill and enslave you. But, but what often comes so quickly to our minds when we think of the Lord as a warrior is also these images of a, a power-crazed warrior or someone with no one to love and nothing to lose. And what this song shows us is that's not the case with Yahweh. What's also amazing about this song is the people's relationship with this warrior God. Notice in verses one through three how their relationship is described. In verse two it says, the Lord is my strength, my song, my salvation. What's so amazing about this warrior God is that he is theirs. It says, this is my God and my father's God. And so when we think of the Lord as a warrior, we're not to think of a tyrant or an abuser or an oppressor, but as one who has bound himself in loving relationship to us. And unlike us, where love can often kind of cloud our vision or make us do rash or unjust things, Instead, his love is shown perfectly in his power as his hand is always righteously and justly for his people in a perfect way. And what is their response to this warrior God who is theirs? Well, verse one, I will sing to the Lord for he has triumphed gloriously. Verse two, I will praise him. I will exalt him. You see, our God is a warrior and his victory his power is praiseworthy for his people. Do you sing about the Lord's power? Do you sing about God's power as a warrior in particular? I've been thinking these last few weeks as I've been reading this account of the first time that I really remember finding delight in the fact that our Lord is a warrior. Uh, I was taking Darcy to the hospital to have Piper, and we, I was trying to play it cool as the husband who would do that. Um, but I was also rather overwhelmed inside, and Darcy probably knew that as well, but I thought I was hiding it. Um, there's little that I can really do in the whole situation. Things should be fine, although not easy. But what about complications? I, I didn't know what could arise, and outcomes can go very poorly. And then one thing that was always on my mind is the lack of schedule or knowing how long it would take. I found myself in very uncharted territory. And so as we were driving to the hospital though, I remember a CD was playing in our little blue Scion and it was an album by a band called Cademan's Call in the company of angels. And a song on that album is called Warrior. And it just repeats in many ways this refrain, the Lord is a warrior. The Lord is mighty in battle. And that refrain was in my head throughout that entire process. And there were a few times I had to leave the hospital and then come back, and that song would be playing and just refreshing in my mind the beauty of the fact that the warrior God was with me, even in these uncertain times. Well, as I think back on that, I wonder, why is it that it was so comforting to me? And I think the reason for that is I realized that the very things that I feared, the very uncertainties that I faced were things that the Lord God himself actually wars against as well. There was, I was thinking of pain in childbirth and the reality is that Christ came into the world to undo the curse altogether. I was thinking of the reality and possibility of impending death. And I was drawn to the idea that death is an enemy that Christ came to defeat. And even though those things may still happen, I found comfort in the fact that knowing my God is with me as a warrior and will one day bring defeat to all those things was helpful to me in that time. And you see, this song calls us to see the power of our warrior God against our enemies. The things that bring us pain and grief and fear are so often the very things that God himself hates and is working all of history to war against. You see, we all suffer. 
regardless of what political party is in power, we suffer in a world that's in rebellion against God and that's following the prince of the power of the air. And no matter what laws are put into place, we will always be experiencing the afflictions of kingdoms that ultimately are at war against God. And we suffer under the experience of not being at true and lasting peace that can only be found in the kingdom of God. Our bodies suffer under death's attack. We struggle with physical ailments and aging and even chronic pain. But we find comfort in the fact that the Lord has come to war against death and against all that it does to our bodies. We see the suffering that sin causes. We feel the brokenness that's in our own souls. We look around and we see lives that are ruined and we see suffering everywhere. And often the battle wounds that we feel are not from swords, but they're from sin. Deep scars from what has been said and done to us and aches in our hearts over what we have said and done to others. But you see, our warrior God has come to put an end to all sin and suffering and death. And you see, when we realize, when we stop and realize that the enemies that we have are the enemies that God himself is fighting against, then we find great comfort in his power that he is fighting for us and that ultimately he will win the battle. And that really leads us to our next point. Not only are we to sing about the power of our God as warrior, but we're also to sing about his presence with us, his presence with us. And we see this in the next few verses of the song, verses 13 to 16. Notice how the song switches from his act of deliverance at the sea to his presence with them as they enter Canaan. Verse 13 says, you have led in your steadfast love the people whom you have redeemed. You have guided them by your strength to your holy abode. The peoples have heard, they tremble. Pangs have seized the inhabitants of Philistia. Now are the chiefs of Edom dismayed. Trembling seizes the leaders of Moab. All the inhabitants of Canaan have melted away. Terror and dread fall upon them. Because of the greatness of your arm, they are still as a stone. Till your people, O Lord, pass by. Till the people pass by whom you have purchased. And so this next section of the song describes how their deliverance from Egypt was not the end of the story and it was not the end of the victory song. His power over his enemies didn't end at the Red Sea, but would continue until all his people reached his holy abode. And that term could refer to Sinai, but probably looking ahead even further to his dwelling with them in the promised land. And the reason that this warrior God remains with his people even after the victory at the Red Sea is given in the description of the people that the Lord leads. Did you notice that this begins and ends this section with a fascinating description of who the Lord's people are? Verse 13, it says, the people whom you redeemed. And then if you look down to verse 16, till the people pass by whom you have purchased. This is that theme of redemption. We learned back in chapter six that the Lord was going to redeem them with an outstretched arm and with great acts of judgment. The idea is a price was paid to have them back from the Egyptians who had enslaved them. A price had been paid for them. And this isn't a demeaning thing, as we may think of it when we think of a price being put on a human life. But the Exodus actually showed their great value to him as their God. There was a cost that was associated with delivering them, a cost of judgment. Blood had to be shed. It cost the death of the firstborns in Egypt. It cost the death of those Passover lambs to set them free. And those things would be commemorated over and over again in the redemption of the firstborns and in the celebration of the Passover. 
And so don't miss what it's saying here about these people whom the Lord saved. He has paid a price to buy back what was rightfully his, to make them free and to make them his people again. And what that reminds us of is that the Lord has a vested interest in what happens to his people on the other side of their deliverance. God not only fights for his people, he pays for those people and he leads those people. And notice how it says the Lord leads. He leads in love. It says in verse 13, you have led in your steadfast love. You see, his, his leading of them is based on his steadfast love, as we heard over and over again in that psalm this morning. His, his covenant to be with his people, to be faithful to them, to do good for them, and to be their God. He leads them according to his love. And this leading in love is also a powerful leading. It's a love and a leading that can handle anything that comes across their path. In verse 16, well, it, it continues and says, you have led them by your strength. And then in verse 16, it says, because of the greatness of your arm, they are as still as a stone. You see, the same love and the same strength that were shown in their deliverance at the Red Sea is the same love and strength that is now being shown in his presence with them along the way. And this song calls them to focus on this perspective of his presence. It's an interesting section because this song was given before the people entered Canaan. We have them singing it right on the other side of the Red Sea. And it speaks of four peoples, the Philistines, the Edomites, the Moabites, the Canaanites. And from the sound of the song, we learn that they're terrified and easily overthrown, it sounds like. They, they melted and they were still as a stone. But when the people are singing this, they had not yet been overthrown. They're still in the wilderness, far from enjoying the rest of the conquest. And when we read the historical accounts about these groups of people in Numbers and in Joshua, what we find is that on the ground, it wasn't that easy. Yes, we get accounts of these people's hearts melting out of their fear of the Lord's deliverance, but there were still battles that followed and sometimes long, epic struggles. Some of these peoples mentioned were not subdued until the time of David. And so the original singers of this song didn't even see or experience the fullness of the victory this song was speaking of. And so why does the Lord have them sing about what would happen in Canaan? You see, this section of the song was to give assurance to the people that as the Lord had been victorious at the Red Sea, so also he was present with them in the conquest of Canaan as their warrior God. And it did not always seem like what they were experiencing were still part of the same victory song, but from God's perspective, it was. The struggles and the doubts and the fears took a long time to unfold, but they were still the people that the Lord had purchased, and he was leading them and powerfully guiding them in his love. And he wanted them to be singing about his presence as they faced their foes. Do you find yourself quick to doubt God's presence or his presence for you? I, I find in my own thinking, I think, sure, you delivered me then and I can think of the cross, you've proven yourself faithful before. <laughs> But now as I face the Philistines and the Edomites and the Moabites, as, as I have Balaam seeking to call down curses upon me as I live this life, it doesn't feel like this is still part of the victory song. It doesn't feel like this is working towards a victorious outcome. But the beauty of this song is that it shows us that in the midst of facing our enemies, in the midst of the journey and the battle, we can sing of God's presence with us as our warrior. Nothing has changed for him. He, it's the same power and the same presence of those whom he has redeemed. 
You see, the price has been paid. The firstborn's blood has been shed. The lamb was slain to purchase us for God. And the scriptures tell us that he gave us his son and will now graciously give us all things. He who began a good work will be faithful to complete that work as he is present with us by his spirit. And so you see, in a sense, every time that we sing of Christ's victory in the cross, we're singing of God's presence with us now. The warrior God who crushed his foes beneath the cross will be with us until we safely pass by. He will lead us safely to his abode, and we can be certain of that as his people. And so this really brings us to the last part of the song. We're called to sing of his power. We're called to sing of his presence. But then notice we're also called to sing of his promise. We sing about the Lord's promise. And we notice this in verses 17 and 18. Verse 17 says this, You will bring them in and plant them on your holy mountain, the place, O Lord, which you have made for your abode, the sanctuary, O Lord, which your hands have established. The Lord will reign forever and ever. Think for a moment about the setting of these people as they're singing the song. The Red Sea battle is behind them, but many battles lie ahead. But do you see that in the song, they're called to sing about the end of the story? It's as if the Lord is saying, keep your eyes and keep your heart fixed on my promise that I've made to you and that I've made to your fathers. And they're singing, you will bring us, you will plant us in the place where you live, in the place where you will reign forever and ever. You see, the end of the song reminds us that the Exodus was never just about leaving Egypt. It was about God's people dwelling with him in his presence. And the beauty of a prophetic song like this, remember Moses was a prophet and Miriam is spoken here of as being a prophetess. The, the beauty of a prophetic song like this is that it looks across the horizon of redemptive history and with concepts like mountains and dwellings and sanctuaries, it calls us to see the vastness of what God has truly promised to do for his people. As we think about how it speaks of mountains, we're reminded that back in Eden, the prophet Ezekiel tells us that Eden was the mountain dwelling of God that was made by his very hands. But then the people were driven out of God's dwelling, and, but they would come to another mountain of God. Soon they will come to Sinai and then on to his mountain temple dwelling in Jerusalem. And the prophets speak of a time when a cosmic mountain will one day fill the entire earth. And this part of the song also speaks of his abode or his sanctuary. He, he dwelt with the people in his Eden sanctuary. Soon he will be dwelling among them in the tabernacle and then on to the temple. But these were all, the temple and the tabernacle in particular, places that were built by human hands. But the author of Hebrews tells us that Jesus has entered the tabernacle that's made without hands. And through his work, that dwelling of God's tabernacling presence comes to us one day in the new heavens and the new earth where there is no temple anymore because it is all temple. It is the place that he has made for his abode. And there he will reign forever and ever. You know, when we hear the word rain, we often think of it in terms of enemies because every rain that we have experienced is one where uh, hopefully there's a time of peace, but we all know that enemies still exist. But see, the eternal reign of God is one where there are no longer any enemies. They're all defeated and his people are with him in his place, under his kingship, reigning with him forever. And this song calls us to lift our eyes to the beauty of God's promise. You see that we, like the Israelites, find ourselves in the place between 
the victory of the cross, and then the final defeat of all our enemies. And right now, we are constantly staring our enemies down in the face whether that's the battle with sin that rages so strong, whether that's the unrest of living apart from eternal shalom, or whether that's death that comes after us all one day. But as we are staring those enemies down, a refrain that can give strength to our heart is to recall these words, the Lord will reign forever and ever. My warrior God is with me, is what we're saying. And he will crush every enemy. And one day he will raise me up to reign with him forever and ever in his holy abode. In a world where there's no more serpent, there's no more sea, there's no more death or sadness or mourning or crying or pain, when every tear has been wiped away. You see, this is what our warrior God has set out to accomplish. Christ has won the victory in the cross, and he will not quit until all things have been made new. So Christian, sing about his power. Sing about his presence. And sing about his promise. We all long to be able to sing these things together again, but we realize that even that, even as we are gathered together, it is just a taste of what it will be when we join with all the heavenly hosts and sing the eternal victory song of our God. And we are a part of that song even now because of the work of Christ. Let's pray. Our Father, we pray that you would help us to be people who sing, whether that's in our hearts because we're in public or people are around or it's just not doable, or whether that's out loud or whether that's gathered together. We pray that your victory would be something that fills our hearts with joy and gratitude. We pray that you as our warrior would bring us great comfort in the midst of our enemies. And we pray that you would fix our eyes on your eternal reign that surely by your grace you have guaranteed that you will bring to us one day. We ask this all in Jesus' name, amen.